CataractCoach.com. we got a cataract quiz. What should you do differently in this cataract surgery? And what are those dark spots? Well, look carefully. This is a patient who has Fuchs corneal endothelial dystrophy. And we can see dropout of endothelial cells there. And this patient has some effect on the vision from the Fuchs dystrophy and most of the effect on the vision from the cataract. Now we've increased the red reflex here in the video to show you those spots from the Fuchs dystrophy, but this patient certainly has a significant degree of cataract. So I'd say at this point, 80% of the visual problem is cataract, 20% is the Fuchs dystrophy. Now a lot of things we can do to analyze the eye ahead of time, such as measuring the cornea, pachymetry, endothelial cells, etc. But let's talk about the surgery here. So you saw we just coated the endothelium with a dispersive viscoelastic. Very important to use a very high quality dispersive viscoelastic. This is not the case to use HPMC, hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, because that dispersive agent doesn't stay along around as, as well in the anterior chamber. It doesn't protect as much. So you want a good agent. So there we've got good coating of the endothelium, a good fill of the anterior chamber, and here comes the capsulorexis. Now, this patient's just going to have a cataract surgery alone. The patient has a pachymetry of about uh, 590 microns and a reasonable endothelial cell count. This patient's also quite elderly, and we're not anticipating that this patient's going to need a corneal endothelial transplant in the next five to eight years. So there's the rexus, that looks great. Five millimeters measured. Now time for hydrodissection. Now watch carefully, we'll lose viscoelastic out the main incision, watch carefully, as we do the hydrodissection. Of course, that's normal, as we put BSS in the eye, we're gonna have to display something out of the eye, and there it is, burping out of that viscoelastic. So in this case, we're going to want to recoat the endothelium prior to putting the phaco probe inside the eye. So we've rotated the nucleus; it looks good. Here's more of the dispersive agent recoating that endothelium. Just centrally, there is the most important part. Phaco probe is going in the eye, bevel down. We're going to try stay away from the corneal endothelium. So we'll buzz into the nucleus, dig in our chopper, and we'll split this nucleus into two halves. And that's, again, done all within the capsular bag. In a case like this, I decrease my flow settings. I want to run less fluid through the eye. We can now buzz and aspirate out that first heminucleus. And notice how we're staying away from the corneal endothelium. We try to bring the pieces and operate at the iris plane. Here's the second half brought up. We can even chop it again and aspirate these pieces using a bare minimum amount of phago energy. So less phaco energy in the eye, less fluid in the eye as well. We don't want to run hundreds of cc's of balanced salt solution through this eye because that's also going to damage the endothelial cells. So staying centrally here, removing the rest of the lens material. Notice how the chopper's in that protective position within the capsule bag just to make sure the posterior capsule stays away from the phaco tip. Certainly in a case like this, you want to avoid at all costs a posterior capsule rupture and vitreous loss because that's going to lead to even more corneal decompensation. So switching over to the IA probe, again, flow rates, choose a low level. 30 cc's, maybe 35 cc's per minute would be reasonable. When you use the phaco power and the phaco part, make sure you're using some sort of phaco power modulations. Burst mode, pulse mode, a variable duty cycle. We've got a whole section on these on phaco fundamentals on cataractcoach.com, and you should certainly review those to make sure you understand how to minimize that energy in the eye. So we're cleaning up our capsular bag here. Let's talk about the IOL power. What are we aiming for here? Well, if you're going to plan to do a DMEC surgery later, that can cause a bit of a shift, and so you may want to leave the patient on the myopic side. So if you're planning the DMEC later, let's aim for at least minus a half as a post-op result, instead of aiming for Plano. This patient's been a lifelong low myope and wishes to retain that low level of myopia, so that makes it easy for us. This patient's been about a minus 225 uh, 
for life, and we're going to leave the patient at about that minus 225 per the patient's request. Now, should you have done a combined FACO and DMEX surgery? Well, not necessarily. Not in this case, I think, because the patient, 80% of the problem was the cataract. And just fixing the cataract alone should be enough to restore this patient to very good visual acuity. And in fact, I can tell you in the post-trial result, this patient has done well, ended up with about 2025 to 2030 um, visual acuity. That's with correction. And the patient's actually quite pleased. So this patient will be monitored on a routine basis. We can do an endothelial cell count and monitor the corneal plachymetry. And if the, do we do get into the situation where a DMEC is required, we can certainly do that at a future date. So I think the stepwise approach is very wise in these cases. Here at the end, we're removing that viscoelastic, being careful to stay away from the endothelium. So nice and easy. Lens looks very well centered. That's pretty good. You see some floaters in the vitreous. Of course, of course, those are of no concern. So gentle hydration of the incision. Don't overinflate the eye. Don't get the pressure up too high. You want this patient at a physiologic pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury or less. Finally, angle sweep, very important. Make sure there's no retained viscoelastic in the eye because that'll also cause a pressure spike. So hopefully these pearls are important. Next time you have a patient with fuchs dystrophy, you'll know what to do.